The Narcissist and Grief Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. I'm a narcissistic psychopath. That means I'm a hybrid. I have both narcissistic personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. Much of my work talks about what are pure narcissists, those who simply have narcissistic personality disorder, divided into the various schools and cadres. There are also pure psychopaths that will have narcissistic traits and strong narcissistic traits, but they're not narcissists. And then you have the hybrids, such as myself. I am working on a series which tells you the similarities and differences between pure narcissists, pure psychopaths, and the hybrid, the narcissistic psychopath. But in this video, I'm going to be explaining the way, utilising my own narcissism, the way that the narcissist regards grief. Grief often relates, of course, to loss. The loss of a human being, the loss of a loved one a loss of a spouse, a brother, a sister, a child. It might be the loss of a friend or a work colleague. People might grieve the fact that an animal has died. They might grieve over the collapse of their business. They may grieve the destruction of their property, the loss of their financial status, their loss of status. There are lots of different things that an individual might grieve Grief is the response to loss, particularly to loss of someone or some living thing that has died, to which a bond or affection was formed. Although conventionally focused on the emotional response to loss, grief also has physical, cognitive, behavioural, social, cultural, spiritual and philosophical dimensions. While the terms are often used interchangeably, bereavement refers to the state of loss, while grief is the reaction to that loss. The grief associated with death is familiar to most people, but individuals grieve in connection with a variety of losses throughout their lives, such as unemployment, ill health, or the end of a relationship. Loss can be categorised as either physical or abstract. Physical loss is related to something that the individual can touch or measure, such as losing a spouse through death, while other types of loss are more abstract, possibly relating to aspects of a person's social interactions. Where a narcissist loses something, that is a threat to control. The loss of a person in the fuel matrix is a threat to control because they're no longer around. In effect, they've put themselves through death beyond the reach of the narcissist. Control can no longer be asserted over them, unless, of course, it was the narcissist that caused their death, which can sometimes happen, but is comparatively rare. The fact that that individual is dead means that they can no longer provide fuel, which could indeed be prob problematic for a narcissist, where it relates to an individual who holds a particularly high position within the fuel matrix, intimate partner primary source being the most notable example in that regard. It could also cause a problem because that individual might have provided residual benefits. The narcissist might have been reliant upon that individual as a source of income to provide a roof over the head of the narcissist to look after the narcissist. And therefore, the narcissist will grieve the loss of the individual. Not because they actually care. Because, of course, there is a bond or affection that was formed, and we do not have that. We connect you to us, but we are not connected to you. See the video, attachment is a form of misery, or attachment is the seat of misery. Nevertheless, you will have witnessed certain narcissists grieving. Why? Well, first of all, it is a reaction to the loss for that which invariably is actually where the narcissist is grieving to themselves, although they don't know that. The narcissist is putting on the waterworks, is quiet, withdrawn. And that is being done by the narcissism because 
It's a genuine reaction to the loss, but not in the way that a non-narcissist would grieve. It's being done for two main purposes. The first is to assert control over those around so that they react in a favourable fashion, being supportive, thus providing fuel and showing that they're under control, and possibly offering some kind of residual benefits. Here I made you a casserole. You've not been eating. Do you need help with expenses, etc.? It also is part of the fitting in, part of the facade, because that is what the expected response is, particularly where somebody has died, is for there to be grief. Now, grief can form in many different ways. There are those that become withdrawn, become depressed. There are those that talk a lot about the person that has gone. There's the individual that denies that they've gone, in a sense. There are individuals that can't stop crying. The narcissist will utilise varying ways of portraying that grief, not because it's a genuine sense of loss, in the way that a non-narcissist experiences, but that there is nevertheless a loss which causes a threat to control, and the narcissism's response is to generate a form of grief, a narcissist's grief. It isn't genuine, albeit it is mourning the loss of something, but for different reasons. The loss in relation to the prime aims. For other people, it's the loss of a friend that brought joy into their lives, the loss of a partner who they'd spent so many years together, the loss of their companionship, their humour, the loss of an individual who they shared so much with. Sometimes the loss may have been completely unexpected, and therefore the nature by which that person has been removed generates that greater degree of loss. It's more shocking, more striking. The grief, of course, as I've mentioned, might not just be with regard to the loss of a person. Non-narcissists could grieve the fact that they've lost a job that they've worked at for a long time and the uncertainty that comes with it. Again, a non-narcissist grieves it because the loss of employment is a threat to control. It affects the status of the narcissist and also, of course, the residual benefit of money. And the narcissist has learned, the narcissist has learned the way to grieve in order to assert that control, to draw fuel, and to fit in. There are different forms by which the grief will appear. Your mid-rangers, typically, with their cognitive empathy and their victim mentality, are the ones that are more likely to put on the wailing display of grief, the ones that make a song and dance at a funeral. The greater will be aloof. They'll be silent, apparently contemplative. But of course, it is just an act. With the lesser, there may be an attempt to shrug it off. No, I'm not bothered. But either way, it is done as a means of asserting control over those who are around the narcissist in order to bring them and keep them under control through this display of grief and also to fit in. The narcissist, of course, has learned how to grieve. This is as a consequence of the narcissism seeing the way that other people respond to loss and has therefore replicated that with the narcissist. Grief for others irritates the narcissist because it's not being directed towards the narcissist and that is why many narcissists, of course, make that song and dance at the funeral to bring it back onto them, to make it as if they are the corpse because then the fuel flows in their direction. There'll be instances whereby the narcissism observes the way that other people respond in the way to loss and then replicates it. Certain narcissists, of course, are more effective at doing so than others. In some instances, you might see the glitch, where the narcissist responds in an inappropriate way, perhaps laughing at a moment which ought to be sombre by appearing not to care, which is actually representative of the fact that the narcissist does not, and actually gives a real glimpse of the way that they actually are. But with the mid-range narcissist, they believe that they are grieving. The lesser narcissist believes that they are grieving, albeit they'll do it in a different way, less obvious, less dramatic, less emotional than a mid-range narcissist. 
The greater knows that they're not grieving. Indeed, the greater is more likely to be irritated by the loss that has occurred, but knows for the purpose of the facade that it's not the done thing to do anything other than don the black suit and mutter the appropriate platitudes. There are instances whereby the narcissism will learn about loss from articles, not only observing other people, but for instance, for understanding the way that we should be responded. So for example, in the Times there was an article, we'll never stop grieving for our children, instead we celebrate their lives. Heartfelt stories were shared at the Hay Festival to mark Celebration Day, a new national event that encourages people to pause and remember loved ones. Articles such as this, which discuss death, discuss the loss of loved ones, discuss the whole process, provide opportunities for the narcissist to, through character trait acquisition, to gather aspects of that for their own use. So as the article explains, the death of any family member is a heartbreaking experience, but to lose a child is perhaps the most painful. Now a group of parents have come together to prove that it is possible to grow around grief. Speaking at the Hay Festival to mark Celebration Day, they called for Britain to break its silence around death and collectively celebrate the lives of loved ones who have died. A composer, an author, and a former police inspector shared deeply personal accounts about the shock of losing their children and offered advice for others who are suffering. Talking about trauma can help to alleviate its symptoms, the parents said before their panel discussion on Sunday. Claire McIntosh, a former Thames Valley police inspector, and her husband took the difficult decision to remove life support from their critical Ill, critically ill son in 2006. As an officer, she regularly carried out death knocks, breaking the news to people about the deaths of family members. It was impossible to predict their reaction, McIntosh, age 46, said. I witnessed so many different emotions, shock, disbelief, anger, resignation, even jubilance. It seemed strange to me then that grief could pre present in so many different ways. I only understood how complex grief was when my son died. I realised my emotions changed from hour to hour, sometimes from minute to minute, that what I needed from friends and family one day was the very opposite to what I needed the next, that grief isn't something we ever get over, but simply learn to live with. These such descriptions that Miss McIntosh talks about there, when read by a narcissist, the narcissist will feel nothing. There is no need to feel anything because there is an absence of emotional empathy. But if a narcissist were sat reading this, then in such circumstances, were the narcissist sat reading this article in a newspaper with, for instance, their intimate partner primary source, they may well then turn and remark about how sad this article is the utilization of cognitive empathy to then assert control over that spouse. A lesser would read it and probably be unlikely to comment about it, having not even the cognitive empathy. A greater may well utilize it in some way of passing comment, again for the purposes of control, but any narcissist that would be sat reading this on their own wouldn't feel anything. But their narcissism may well, through a process of assimilation, utilise this information and store it. I've explained to you in the video The Imitation Game how you can envisage a warehouse or packages of responses to certain situations. And as certain narcissists would read this information, they would be likely, though not always, to log the information in that imaginary warehouse. The lessers unlikely to do so, but mid-range and greater would utilise what is spoken about, what is written about in the article, the reactions of people to learn, to improve that cognitive empathy. Not only could the information be utilised for the purpose of discussion, oh, there is a move afoot for a celebration day, do you know what that is? And then expressing a view as to whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for the purposes of provocation or the assertion of control by appearing to be sympathetic. But articles such as this, where it discusses the emotions of those who are affected as they grieve death, are instructive 
to the mid-range and greater narcissist to enable them to bolt on to their existing repertoire appropriate reactions, to learn that shock could be expressed, disbelief, anger, resignation, possibly a form of jubilance. This is how the narcissist learns, where cognitive empathy is evident in the mid-range or greater narcissist. It isn't learned because there is emotional empathy. It's learned because it so suits the purpose of the narcissist. The extent of the learning depends upon the type of narcissist. The lesser may well read it and then just jettison it, not particularly interested in it, may refer to it dismissively in front of somebody else in order to provoke them. They might say, for example, this stupid celebration day sounds like the type of nonsense you get involved with, they would say to a spouse that's in devaluation. The mid-range and greater would utilise it, both in terms of in the now, if they were with somebody else, for the purposes of assertion and control and drawing of fuel, and if they are not, the logging of the information and the way that it is logged is dependent upon the type of narcissist that they are and how they might use it in the future. Grief is experienced by narcissists, but not in the way that non-narcissists experience. It is a grieving for loss, which is created by the narcissism, the loss always relates to the loss of the prime aims. And the response is one that's manufactured for the purposes of the pursuit of the prime aims and the ability to fit in as part of facade management. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.